Amen. Another great day, great afternoon in the presence of God. We're going to just jump right into our into our message today. But before we do, I want to read a little bit about um, the commands of God. We're in a series that we're talking about the Ten Commands, the Ten Commandments of God. And we've been going through each and every one of the commandments, talking about the principle behind every one of the commandments. And what I want to do today is I just want to go back a little bit, right to the very introduction about why we have the commands. And I believe that God has spoken to me just a little bit that kind of want to help us to understand the commands of God just a little bit more. <clears throat> so what we talked about at the beginning is that God did not give us his commands in order for us to gain salvation. It's not a bunch of do's that we have to do in order to make God happy or to please God or to earn our salvation in any way. That wasn't the purpose. That wasn't the intent of the commands. But what it was is that God gave these commands as a way of establishing a new nation. It was the beginning of the nation of Israel. And God said, these are 10 commands. And they're good for the relationships. The relationships that we have with God and the relationships that we have with each other. And so as we look through each of these commands, we see that God has specific commands for us to continue in a good relationship with God. But as we talk about the commands, I want to look at one command, the very first command that God gave to Adam and Eve. And it was the command that, Adam, that God gave to Adam and Eve where he said, don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so they had the whole Garden of Eden. They had all of the trees. They had all of the plants. They could enjoy any of the fruits and the vegetables in the garden. But God said, for this one tree, don't eat of it. And if you're familiar with the story, we know the story. We know um, what ended up happening. They were tempted by the serpent, and they ended up eating from the, tree, the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But I want to read what happened and the temptation that they faced in that place at that time. Uh, I'm reading from Genesis chapter 3, and it says, Now the serpent was the most cunning of all the wild animals that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? So the first thing we see is that the serpent questioned God's word. The serpent questioned God's word. He said, Did God really say that you can't eat from any tree in the garden? Then the woman said to the serpent, we may, eat the tree, we may eat the fruit from the trees in the garden, but about the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, God said, you must not eat it or touch it or you will die. So God's specific command to Adam was only don't eat. But here we, say, we see that Eve said, we must not eat of it or touch it or you will die. And then the serpent said, no, you will not die. In fact, God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So we see that the serpent questioned God's word. He lied about God's word. And he spoke words that made Eve feel that God was holding something back from them. That God was holding something back that was desirable, that was good for wisdom, that would help them. And so we see that Satan questioned God's word and lied about it. Now, I think it's important that when we think about the Ten Commandments, that we think the right thoughts about it. I believe that Satan wants to lie to us about the Ten Commandments. One of the lies that we hear a lot of the time about the commands or the ways of God is that God some, we, we might not hear people say this, but a lot of people think this. God doesn't want me to have fun. God is a restricting God. He's very legalistic. He doesn't want me to have fun. He knows all of these things. And so he says, don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, don't do that, because he wants to control us and keep the fun things away from us. But that's a lie. That's a lie. And so that's one of the lies, I believe, 
that we hear or we feel sometimes about the Ten Commandments. The second one would be that the, t the Ten Commandments are not applicable in today's, today's world after the cross. Oh, we're under grace. We can do what we want. The, the commands don't mean anything now because we have God's grace. But Paul wrote, should we continue in sin that, gra that grace may abound? He said, God forbid. He said, don't even think like that. That's another lie that we hear and we think and we are tempted to feel about the commands. And so I believe that there are two extremes. One that God's legalistic, one that God doesn't care. And the reality is, is that neither of those are true. Neither of those are true. Why did God give us the commands? The commands were not given for us to make God happy. God gave the commands so that we could live a life of happiness. So that we can live in God's parameters. God knew why he gave us the commands because he knows that the ways in which this world should live. He knows the ways that we, that we should live and he knows the things that will be good for our lives. And he said, do this, don't do that, because if you do, you will be blessed. You will have a good life. You'll have a happy life. The commands, if we follow them, will bring peace. The commands, if we follow them, will bring joy. The commands, if we follow them, will bring fulfillment. They'll bring rest. They'll bring prosperity. And they'll bring intimacy in our relationships with God and in our relationships with others. So I believe that even today, there's a temptation, just like Eve faced in the garden. Satan wants to say, God's keeping this from you. You're not going to have any fun. God's got all these things. He's hiding them from you. But that's a lie. That's a lie. God has the best for us. And the best that God has for us is here in these principles. The principles that God gave to us in the Ten Commandments. And that's why we're studying them. We're not studying them so that we can live a rigid life. That we, oh, we can't do this, we can't. No, God brought us into freedom. Freedom to do and to follow him. And to live the adventure that God has for us. But there are some, there are some things that God says, this will bring destruction to your life. This will make your life more difficult. This will bring you regret. This will bring you pain. Stay away from these things. God's a good father. He wants to protect us from the things that will destroy us. So he gives us these commands. Do this, do this, do this, and you'll live a life of blessing. We see that even in some of the commands. There's promises. You'll live a long life. You'll live a full life. You'll live a life of peace and blessing and prosperity. But that's the commands of God. And so that's why we're studying these. We're studying these commands because God, we want to live the blessed life that God has for us. We want to live that abundant life. And so today we're looking at the ninth command. It's the principle of honesty. And so each of these commands have a certain principle. This ninth command is the principle of honesty. It's in Exodus 20, verse 16. It says, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. All right? Don't bear false witness against your neighbor. Now, what does that mean, bear false witness? Well, basically it's saying don't lie about your neighbor. Don't lie about your neighbor. Bearing false witness is lying about something that your neighbor did that would bring condemnation or judgment to them. Okay? For example, if I said that my neighbor stole something from me. Okay, well, that's a, a serious accusation. That's saying that my neighbor broke one of the commands. Okay? That's a serious accusation, and there's a penalty for stealing. Just think, if you lived back in the Israelite days, there's a penalty for stealing. It says, 
You either have to pay back twice or four times or five times, depending on what it was. And so if I say to, if I say to the judges or the elders during that time, the people who would bring judgment at those times, if I say, okay, my neighbor stole something from me. I'm lying about my neighbor. Okay, I'm lying about something that my neighbor did. And so that would be something serious because then my neighbor would face judgment for that. In the Bible, it says that there must be two or three witnesses in order to bring a judgment against somebody. And, that, and the reason for that is that just so we can't have just one person saying something, all right, well, make them pay it back because they stole on the word of one person. No, the, it has to be at least two or three people. And there's actually a story in the Bible later on, I believe it's in uh, 1 Kings or 2 Kings, when there, when there was a, a person who hired two foolish people to say that somebody did something that they really didn't do. So those people were two witnesses who lied about something, and because they lied about something, that person face judgment for what they said that they did. And so we see that in the commands, it says, do not bring a false witness. Do not bear false witness against your neighbor. So God was trying to establish a civilized society. So there were rules, there were things in relationships, there were things like don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't, don't do this, don't do that, don't covet, and all of those things. But sometimes people broke the, broke the laws. And on the word of two or three witnesses, then they would bring judgment against that person. In Deuteronomy chapter 19, we also, we also see what happens to someone who did bring a false accusation or a false testimony against someone. It says, the judges shall inquire diligently. So it means that they need to do a lot of work in order to find out the truth. And if the witness is a false witness and has accused his brother falsely, then do to him as he had meant to do to his brother, to take the evil from your midst. So what this verse is saying is saying that if you are a false witness and you lied about somebody, maybe, for example, uh, you lied that somebody stole something from you. If you lied about somebody stealing something from you, then you are the one who will face the punishment that that person would have faced if they really did steal something. Or if you were... If you accuse somebody of murder, okay, you say, this person murdered so-and-so. And then the judges look around and they figure out that you're a liar. Then you are the one that will face the punishment for what a murderer would normally face. In the case of murder, you, you would lose your life. In the case of stealing, you'd have to pay back something. So you would face the exact same punishment if you were a liar and brought false witness against somebody else. That's how serious it was. When we look at the story of Jesus, okay, in the story of Jesus, when he was brought before uh, the high priest, they tried to accuse him of something. They tried to accuse him of blasphemy and and it's interesting because in that story, as they were going through, they couldn't find two people whose story was the same because he was innocent. And so they were looking for two people who, who could say the same story about what Jesus did, about the wrongs that Jesus did. And so maybe they had one person who said, yeah, Jesus did da-da-da-da-da-da-da, and they gave this story. And then they had the other person that said, no, Jesus, they said, yeah, Jesus did this, 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 and this. But the stories didn't match. They can, afterwards, they compared the stories and they didn't match. Because they were trying to get, they were trying to accuse Jesus 
on this principle of two or three people. But people were lying about Jesus, and they weren't, and their stories didn't match up together. So this is why. This is why we have this command, is so that we can have truth and honesty in this new society that God was bringing. And it's a principle of honesty to always be truthful in what we do and in what we say. And so this is, this is the, the, the atmosphere. God wanted us to have an atmosphere. God wanted the, the Israelites to have an atmosphere of always telling the truth, of always living according to the truth. Even if the truth hurts, that's okay. We have the truth, but even if the truth hurts, that's okay. We'll still live in the truth. It's better than living in the lie. So there's three points that we have today. The first point in the principle of honesty is to be honest with yourself. Tell the truth inside of you. Dishonest people can convince themselves that they are right. Dishonest people, they can convince themselves that they are right. They don't have truth within them. They don't have an absolute. An absolute is an unchangeable truth or an unchangeable moral code. And the person who is dishonest doesn't have that inside of them. They don't have those absolutes within them that this is right and this is wrong, but they have, they, they live according to what they feel on the inside, but they don't have these moral absolutes within them. But if we can't be honest with ourselves, if we can't say, yes, I did wrong, if we can't say, I made a mistake, I broke God's law. If we can't do that, then God can't help us. If we don't admit that we need help, how can God help us? Repenting is changing our mind from our way of thinking to God's way of thinking. From our lies to God's truth. And when we when we. When we hang on to God's truth, we're denying the lies and saying, God, your way is the right way, and I'm going to live on the inside according to your truth. I'm going to accept your truth, and I'm going to put your truth as the, as, as the standard, as the line that I measure myself up with, and everything else has to line up with that, and if it doesn't, it's wrong. And so when we, when we live according to God's truth, then those lies start to go away. But if we say, no, I'm okay. My problems aren't that bad. I can do this. I can do that. And we start to justify ourselves, then God can't help us. The first step in getting close to God is saying, yep, I'm wrong. Yep, I'm wrong. I'm not right. I made a mistake. I sinned. These are the most powerful words that we can say because it strips away all of the lies that we have within us. It strips away all those lies and it starts to build on the foundation of truth starts to build on the foundation of truth. Some people are so hurt and wounded that they have never experienced God's healing. And they need to be dishonest in order to function. You know, I've heard that in Alcoholics Anonymous, Alcoholics Anonymous is, a, is a, a program that helps alcoholics. And they say for the people who are helping the alcoholic, they say the way that you can tell an alcoholic is when they say, nope, I'm not an alcoholic. 
You know that they have a problem when they say, nope, I'm not an alcoholic. I can help myself. I can fix myself. You know they have a problem when they say that. Because they're lying to themselves. They're saying, yeah, everything's okay. Not a problem. I can do it. But they're way beyond help. They can't do it on their own. The same is true for when we lie about ourselves. Yep, I don't have a problem. It's, it's not that bad. I'm okay. Don't worry about it. I can fix it. It's just something little. It's not that big of a deal. No, the first step is to be honest with yourself. If you can't be honest about mistakes, you're never going to be free. The people who say, yeah, it's not that bad, it's not that bad, it's not that bad, they're always struggling with the same things over and over and over and over again. They never have freedom from it. But the people who say, God, look at me. I got this problem. I need you. I need help. Then God enters into the situation. God brings people that can help you walk through the steps of freedom. And you get free. But the people who say, yeah, it's not that bad. Those are the people who year after year after year after year struggle with the exact same things. And if you want to get free, the first step is to be honest. Not just honest with God. Some people say, yeah, I confess to God. Yeah, that's good. Okay? But God puts us in community. He puts us in family. He puts us in a church for a reason. And that's to join our hearts and our faith and our strength together so we can help each other walk in this life into freedom. So if you're struggling with something, if you know that you've lied to yourself, if you know that, if you ever heard yourself say, yeah, it's not that bad. Yeah, I'll, I'll make it through. I can fix it. I just got to do this and this and this and this. No, stop lying to yourself. Confess, repent, and get close to God. Be honest with others. How many people have you ever, have ever heard someone say, honestly, da-da-da-da-da-da-da. Or, I'm being honest with you. Da, 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 da. So I start to think, so now you're being honest with me. Does that mean before you weren't being honest with me? Or they say, honestly. Okay, well, okay. Then I think, well, that's, now that's honest, but what about what he said before? So were you not being honest before then? Now you're being honest now. So 50-50 sometimes when you are, sometimes when you're not. No, let's just always be honest with each other. Let's always be honest with each other. Now, this doesn't mean that you just have to go and blab everything that you've ever done or ever said to everybody that you meet. No, but let's not be someone who covers things up. Let's not be someone who exaggerates in order to impress people. Let's be honest with each other. James 5, 16. Now we're going to talk about this verse a couple different ways. But listen to what this says. James 5, 16. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. So this is taking the first principle and the second principle and putting them together. So the first one is be honest with yourself. Second one is being honest with each other. So he says, therefore, confess your sins to one another that, and pray for one another that you may be healed. And then look at the second half of this verse. Normally we quote this one, the prayer of a righteous man, righteous, righteous person has great power is working. It's the, 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 the effective prayer of a righteous man availeth much. That's what we, we say all the time. But what about the first part of the verse? Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray together that you may be healed. So if you want healing, be honest. Be honest with yourself. Be honest with each other. Now, I would encourage you 
be careful who you confess to. Make sure it's someone who you trust, someone who doesn't gossip, someone who isn't going to laugh at you and say, ah, ha, 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 I knew you had a problem. No, don't do that. But get with someone who you know, who you know they love you, has your best interests at heart, someone who you look up to and you know they can bring strength into your life. Go ahead and do that. And you'll see healing that you may be healed. I think we miss a lot of healing in our lives because we're not honest. God wants to bring healing into your life. God wants to bring life into you. There's places that are sick inside of you. Maybe in your soul, maybe even in your body from the stuff that's been going on. Confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. There's power in confession. There's power in truth. There's power in bringing two people together who are committed to truth and righteousness. And sometimes, if I have a problem, I need help from somebody else. If you have a problem, maybe you need help from somebody else. You can't do it on your own. You can't do it on your own. Yeah, you need God. It's good to confess to God. But God lives through us. He lives through other Christians. He brings that strength together and be healed. Just like it says in James 5, 16. A wise person is a person who invites correction into their life. A wise person says, when, when, they're, when they're confronted with a weakness or a sin or a problem or a mistake, they invite correction. When they're corrected, they say, thank you. Thank you for correcting me in that. I want to grow. I want to change. I want to do better. Help me. That's a wise person. And they invite correction. A foolish person, a foolish person blames others. A foolish person is not honest with themselves. A foolish person says it's not that big of a deal. And that person can only be corrected through consequences. And so it's important that if we don't want the consequences in our life, then invite correction into your life. Be truthful. Say, yep, yep, I, need, I, I have this problem. I need help. When someone comes to you and says, Jason, this thing is, is, is something that maybe you don't see. Maybe, you've, maybe you're lying to yourself. Maybe you're, you're blind in this area and you can't see it. If I'm wise, I want to say, yes, thank you. Thank you for helping me to see that. I need to change in that. I need to grow in this area. I need to do better. But if I'm foolish, I'll say, oh, it's his fault. When I was a kid, this happened, this and that. When this happened, that and that. Or this person did that. And it's saying, it's his fault, not mine. It's not taking responsibility for your own actions. I don't want to be a fool. I want to be wise. And a wise person is honest with themselves and honest with others. We can help people who are honest with each other. We can help people who are honest and truthful. But if you're going to lie and cover up and say it's not that big of a deal, it's hard, really, really hard to grow and to change. Because you're just saying, yeah, I, I got it. I can help. I can do it on my own. These people who lie about themselves or lie to themselves, they're also full of pride because they think they can fix themselves. But let's not be like that. We need God. We need each other. We need to grow. So let's be truthful. Also, let's be honest with God. How does God feel when you're dishonest with him? He knows the truth already. <clears throat> Sometimes we can lie to others and 
Maybe they don't know the exact truth. Maybe they believe us because they're good-hearted and good-natured and they want to believe the best about us. But you can't lie to God. God knows already. He saw what happened. He knows what you did. So we can't lie to God. It's, it's treating God like, God, yeah, I lie. You know, lying to God, it's, it's like saying, God, you're not, you're, not, um, you're not omniscient. You don't know everything. I can hide things from God. That's not true. We're the ones who are being foolish when we do that. But the amazing thing, and I think this is where it all comes together, <clears throat> is that God already knew what you did. He saw what you did. He knows the truth about what you did. He saw the mistakes. He saw our failures. But he knew already. He knew it was going to happen. And he saw when it did happen. So for us to lie to him, that's foolishness on our part. But the thing is, he saw it and he still loves you. He saw it and he still loves us and accepts us and wants us. But the thing is, we have to say to God, you're right. You're right. I made a mistake. I fell. Please forgive me. And it's being honest with him. Saying, God, you're right. You're right. Because when, we're, when, when, when that happens, it changes something inside of us. It turns ourselves away from ourselves and turns ourselves towards the truth. And when we're turned towards the truth, we see the light and we see the reality of all that is dark within us. It breaks the pride that we have inside of us. Listen to what Psalms 32 verses 1 to 4 says. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Okay? Now, it says whose sin is covered. It's not meaning that it's hidden from God. It's meaning that God has covered over it with his grace and with his mercy. So blessed is the man whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity. And David goes on to say, For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. When I didn't confess to God, when I hid my sin, when I kept it to myself, I started to waste away inside of me. The pain and the hurt, the regret, the shame. I was wasting away inside of me. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. That's how I was when I hid my own sin, when I didn't confess it to God. And it's interesting, in Psalms, many of the Psalms, they use a certain word that says selah, S-E-L-A-H, selah. It means to stop and think about it for a minute. So David goes through and says, I kept silent, my bones wasted away, my, I was groaning, your hand was heavy upon me, my strength was dried up. And then he says, think about it. Stop and think about it, selah. Why do we stop and think about it? Because we don't want that to happen. We want to be like the person whose transgressions are forgiven. So let's get it out in the open. Let's say, God, here it is. In all the grossness, in all the yuckiness that's inside of me, here it is. The good, the bad, the ugly, everything, here it is. And then God floods us with his grace and with his mercy. God wants us to be honest with ourselves, honest with each other, and honest with him. This is one of the most freeing principles that we can embrace in our lives, is the principle of honesty. This principle of honesty. If we can choose to be people who are honest, 
and live life like one person. That's what integrity means. You're living life like one person. A dishonest person, when we're with, they're with these people, they live this way. When they're with these people, they live this other way. When they're in church, they live this way. When with, they're with their or, or worldly friends, they're living. They got two different lives, maybe three or four different lives. But an honest person says, I'm only one person, and this is me. They take the good and the bad and say, yeah, this is who I am, but God, help me. Change me, mold me, shape me. Come into my life and make me more like you by your truth, by your righteousness, by your grace, by your mercy. This is the goal that God has for each of us as Christians to be people of integrity, people who live one life. In closing, I want to read two, two verses. Listen to this verse in Acts chapter 3, verses 19 and 20. Repent. Like I said before, repent is changing our minds from our lives to God's truth. He says, repent therefore and turn back that your sins may be blotted out that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. That times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. A lot of times we think, all right, let's get into the presence of God. Let's worship. Let's praise. Let's get together. We feel the presence of God. We feel refreshing. And we feel like, yeah, that's God's presence. I feel so refreshed in God's presence. But this verse says nothing about worship and praise. It says, repent. Repent. When we come to the truth, there is refreshing. Because all those lies and all that darkness is exposed. We don't have to hide it anymore. But there's the refreshing that comes from God. It says, refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus. And in John 8, Jesus says, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Freedom from what? Freedom from lies. Freedom from darkness. Freedom from pain freedom from shame because when we confess and repent we have access to God's grace and mercy but when we hide and we keep to ourselves and when we lie God says I can't help you you're not being honest I can't I want I want to give you my grace I want to give you my mercy but you're lying about who you really are the, 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 the darkness, the grossness that's inside of you. So come, repent. This is God's invitation. Repent. Come to his truth that grace and mercy may abound to you. This is what God has for us. Let's be people who live by this principle of honesty. Honesty within ourselves honesty with each other, and honesty before God. God's a good God. God's a good God. He knows everything about us. He knows the good and the bad, but he still accepts us. But he wants us to be honest. He wants us to be honest with him. And that's the first step to coming in to his grace and his mercy. I believe that I believe that the Holy Spirit is working on some of you who are watching and listening right now. And I just want you to respond to what the Holy Spirit is doing in your heart. Maybe you've lived a double life. Maybe you've hidden some things. Maybe you're not being honest with yourself or with others or with God. The first step is repenting before God. I want to encourage you, though. Confess to someone you know and love and who loves you and someone that you trust. 
so that you can be healed and that times of refreshing can come to you. Get into a small group. We have small groups all over. During this time, with this virus going around, we, we can't meet together as a big church, but we have small groups all over the place where you can connect with someone who is a leader in our church and a leader in our teams. Get into a small group. If you need personal prayer, we have all of our, our teams ready. They're online right now. They're online watching the service with you. Send them, a, send them a personal message. Say, hey, I need prayer with this. I need to meet with you. I have something I need to confess with you because I want healing. Take these steps. Repenting is being bold, and it takes a little bit of courage. But it's something that God wants all of us to do. We all have to take that step. Even if you've been a Christian a long time and there's something that you've been struggling with, it's okay. Just take that step and say, yep, I need help in this area. Let me pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for each person who's watching right now. I thank you that you're moving by your Holy Spirit. You're not far away from us, but you're with us as close as our heart. And I just thank you for your word. I thank you for your, your strength and your power. And I just pray, God, by your Holy Spirit, that you would continue your work. I pray for boldness and courage for each person who hears right now, to, that they would be bold and courageous to come to the truth and say, God, I believe. I, this is the truth. I'm not going to hide anymore. I'm not going to lie anymore. I want truth. And so I repent. And say, God, your way is truth. God, I pray for boldness and courage. Lord, I pray for connection for each person. Pray they be connected with others, people that they can be truthful and honest with. Pray for connection with leaders. And I just pray, God, that you would just help them grow through this time and that they would be healed and refreshed by your Holy Spirit as they come to truth. Pray your blessings on them, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Like I said, if you guys are out there and you need to talk to somebody, send us a personal message on our Facebook page. We have lots of people, lots of pastors, lots of leaders who are ready and willing to follow up with you, meet together with you, give you a call. And we want to see all of us as a church continue to grow, continue to grow in your spiritual walk with Jesus. God loves you. Jesus loves you. He has a great plan for you. He's got a great plan for you for this week. Embrace the truth. Walk in boldness and walk in him. It's going to be a great week. God bless you guys. We'll see you all next week. Amen.